episode of Pop Health Week is sponsored by Health Innovation Media. Health Innovation Media brings your brand narrative alive both on the ground and in the virtual space for major trade show, conference, and innovation summits via our signature pop-up studio. Connect with us at www.popupstudio.productions. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media, publisher of ACLWatch.com, and your Pop Health Week co-host with my partner, co-founder Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health, LLC, a Jacksonville, Florida-based consulting firm. In our continuing series on the impact of systemic racism inherent in our healthcare system, on today's show, our guest is Bridgette M. Bronner, Ph.D., APRN, an associate professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Dr. Bronner's specialty includes social justice through nursing, where data from geographic information systems are leveraged to develop interventions for urban populations that improve family and community health and promote sexual health, such as preventing HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, and via the broader lens of methods and models to improve the health of historically underserved people and communities. So with that introduction, Fred, over to you. Help us get to know Bridgette M. Bronner. Thank you so much, Greg and Bridgette. Welcome to Pop Health Week. Thank you for having me and for using your platform for this really important work. Oh, it's really my pleasure. It's something that Greg and I have talked about and decided, you know, as we said, for the next series of who knows how many months, potentially, we're going to focus on this whole issue of racism, bias, health disparities, discrimination, etc. So I'm really glad to get a chance to talk to you. Why don't we start with perhaps giving us a little bit of your background and the work you're doing at the nursing program at University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my name is Dr. Bridgette Bronner. I am an associate professor of nursing at Penn Nursing, um, as well as a senior fellow in the Center for Public Health Initiatives at the university. And my research centers on health inequities, and I use that word inequity deliberately because we're not just talking about differences in health, but these are unfair and unjust differences that are experienced by certain groups. And so for me, because these inequities are avoidable, I use research as an advocacy tool to inform interventions as well as policies that can help promote health and reduce risk. And so ultimately, the goal is to eliminate the ways that these like individual social and structural factors are causing people, particularly those in black and brown communities, to disproportionately get sick and um, even sometimes die. I actually saw your name in this article titled COVID-19's Assault on Black and Brown Communities in which they interviewed you. Could you talk through some of the statistics and issues that you're seeing and then some of how you're trying to research that? Yeah, definitely. So I have not done directly any COVID-19 related studies. Mm -hmm. Most of my work has been in HIV, but looking at the racial disparities data for COVID-19, it's like the same playbook plays out over and over again, regardless of what health condition we're talking about. And so when you drill down the numbers, let's say for Philadelphia, you know, you're seeing fatality rates from COVID-19 two to three times that among Blacks is what you see in white populations, or even uh, APM did some research and we're looking at the thousands of lives, you know, that were lost because of disparities that we're seeing in care. And they've even drilled it down by age, where initially we were thinking that younger people would be less affected by coronavirus, but they're actually seeing in younger demographics that there were death rates nine times that of whites among blacks. And I believe it was in the 25 to 44 year old age population. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot where there's just these differences, these inequities between racial and ethnic groups. Uh, But what I really want us to hang our hat on is that these differences that we're seeing are not reflecting race, right? Race is a social construct. It is not something that is biological or genetically Mm -hmm. driven. So the numbers, instead of reflecting race, they're actually showing us racism. They're actually showing us what the shared experience of being Black, Latino, Native American, you know, Asian in America, what that's doing to the physical body and how it plays out in our health. And you mentioned a really good point that while we're clearly seeing this with COVID and it's getting a lot more attention, and I'm seeing it all over Twitter and in the press and the media about Mm -hmm. the disparities, and as you said, the health inequities, Mm -hmm. it's been around in HIV for a a long time, and you study that, even though we're not thinking about HIV as much. So could you sort of dive into that area and what we're seeing in HIV in terms of the differences in outcomes? 
Yes, absolutely. So when you look, right, and you say, okay, African Americans represent 13% of the population, or when you're looking at um, late diagnoses, meaning that someone has been HIV positive for a length of time, and by the time they access the care system, they have already advanced in the state of the disease and are, you know, more likely to have worse outcomes. We're looking at the numbers, and it's something, again, where from the early days of the epidemic, you know, just like we're doing with coronavirus now, we were targeting people's behaviors. So we were saying, you know, well, what are those people doing over there to put themselves at risk? And when we Mm -hmm. do that, you know, we completely absolve and ignore the fact that things such as redlining controlled where people could live, you know, and not only where they lived, but the types of resources and healthcare system infrastructure that was available in those communities. So it all the common thread that we come back down to is injustice, you know, historical injustice that has happened over time and how until we get to those core root issues, whether it is HIV, diabetes, maternal mortality, you know, coronavirus, we're always going to see this inequity between groups because people don't have the same basic rights, right, the same basic access to the things Mm -hmm. that they need to be healthy and thrive. Right. So let's sort of dive into that a little bit. As you go down, everyone talks social determinants of health now, social determinants of health, and, you know, we recognize it's it's housing, it's food, it's access, it's transportation. Can you talk about specifically the structural things that are creating those those problems down at that level? Absolutely. So if we start, let's say, with housing, um, we know that people who are unstably housed have increased risk for a variety of different conditions. And that can come from, you know, the basics of not having shelter, of not having food, um, of people having to either engage in different activities to make a living. So let's say with coronavirus, they may be an essential worker in a grocery store or doing, you know, deliveries or something else. And so by virtue of their work, they're being exposed to more people. And then they're living in an area where maybe there's overcrowding, you know, or they're in um, an apartment building where they're living with hundreds, sometimes thousands of other individuals. So when you're talking about communicable, communicable, excuse me, diseases in particular, it's almost a number game of like sheer exposure, right? The number of people that you're exposed to. And so when we look at Housing and access to housing is not only where people live, but the types of conditions that they live in, which also ties in, you know, with work and employment. Another determinant with employment is looking at, let's say, sick pay leave. So people who right now during this epidemic didn't have the privilege of working from home, they had to go to work. And we know that black and brown workers are disproportionately represented in that population. So with our social determinants, you know, there are multiple housing, economics, employment, the types of resources that are available in communities that drive and affect our ability to be healthy. And you've obviously been researching this for a while. Many of us in the field have seen these issues, whether it was when I first worked in Medicaid and saw the differences and the issues that we we had to deal with to to help the individuals first so that then they could help themselves with health care, but try to solve those other things that were impacting their lives. Who do we need to get that message out to now? Who needs to hear this? That's an excellent question. So that's where the frustration lies, right? Typically we do this and we're preaching to the choir because there are numbers of individuals, hundreds of people who before me, right, and even now have been doing this work for decades. They've been publishing, they've been researching, they've been, you know, activists on the front lines and they either were not taken seriously or people, it was so much easier to just check the race box and say this is happening, you know, because people are black or because people are Latino. And so now we want the mass to hear this message for people who have positions of power and authority, those who are making laws, those who create policy, those who are heads of organizations who can do things like working towards stable housing, you know, and universal health care for all. So we want this to be something where we're engaging people who traditionally have not been a part of this conversation. Um, And to make it clear, it's not that they were excluded. I think people were just living in their own lives, right, in a different aspect of their lived experiences where their eyes weren't necessarily as open to this as it might be now. And so if we can engage more people, especially those, you know, and I'll just say it, white people with privilege and power and in positions of influence to step in and to be able to say, okay, what can I do within my sphere of influence to bring about change and to make a difference? Or, you know, for those who have political power, what can I do, you know, in my areas to make a difference and so that we can see to it that 
that in these areas where we're seeing injustice, in these areas, you know, where we have this person get this type of education in their neighborhood school while another person gets something, you know, completely different, how can we level the playing field so that it is more equitable for all? And you said something I think is so important. You said, what can I do? And, it's you know, there have been words played in this for decades, and it really mm-hmm. is about doing something, isn't it? Yeah. And I think sometimes it feels paralyzing, right? So the things that we're talking about are big, and it starts to feel like something that one person can't have control over. So when you look at macro-level factors, right, let's say if we stick with the example of what mortgage redlining did then and continues to do now, that sounds big. So what can I as one person do about the fact that there are people who have been relegated to live in certain areas, and any time that we go to build those areas up, you know, through gentrification, we displace the original residents to make that happen. All right, so it may feel big and like I can't do anything about that, but it takes one person having a conversation. You know, it takes one person working with a real estate development company that says before we, you know, look to have people move in here from outside of the community, let's work with people who are already here toward home ownership, right, toward community redevelopment within the neighborhood. And so there are things that we can do. I think we just each have to really think strategically as far as what are we good at, where is our expertise, what resources are we tapped into, because truthfully we have exceeded the timeline to do nothing, right? Things can feel big and that can be very paralyzing, but we have come to a place where we literally as a nation can no longer afford to not address injustice because it is making us sick. We are losing lives, you know, unnecessarily. And so if we can each just say, even if I make one phone call, even if I watch one webinar, you know, even if I revisit the policies of my own business, whatever role we play, if we each do something, I truly believe it can make a difference. And if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Pop Health Week. Our guest is Bridgette M. Bronner, Ph.D., APRN, an associate professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. So taking that a little further, what should the role of the healthcare system be and what should the healthcare system be doing? That is excellent. The healthcare system, so for me as a nurse, I think we're really kind of like a, an anchor point in all of this. When we look at coronavirus and what's happening, we have just as a system failed. I mean, it's not even only on the system. There's, you know, higher level factors that went into play to get us where we are. But we had issues with people coming for testing and being denied multiple times. And not only denied because the testing criteria weren't clear, but there were ways where implicit and explicit bias played out. So you see an African-American male who is, let's say, um, overweight, has high blood pressure, you know, a history of asthma. And so he comes in with COVID-19 symptoms and you say, oh, it's just bronchitis, you know, and so you send him home with a bronchitis regimen. And so I think within our system, we have to do a much better job of taking people's symptoms seriously, of listening to what they're saying is going on with their bodies, of doing complete and thorough work up, you know, and advocating for that so that we're not just assuming what's going on based on like these racial heuristics that we've been accustomed to, but actually letting the symptoms and letting the chief complaint speak, you know, to do what needs to be done and then holding our colleagues accountable to speak up against discriminatory practices, but then doing that like difficult, deep inner work to address our own implicit and explicit biases. Because when we think about it, right, like as a healthcare system, we know that it is built and it has structures of racism and discrimination, but our licenses, especially for us as nurses, right, we have an obligation to our license to stand against those things at all levels so that people can reach their full health potential. And Dr. Bronner, you brought up the issue of nursing. and Obviously, you, you know, you've got your doctorate in that and, and working as an associate professor. Are there things that nursing should do differently or educational approaches we may want to put into the programs or things like that to assist in this area? 
Yeah, I had the um, privilege of participating in a webinar for the American Nurses Association, and we specifically talked about this, the role that nursing can play in racial disparities in COVID-19. Um, it's, it's free for those who want to register and open regardless of ANA membership. So I would say anybody who is really interested in digging a little deeper than what we can do right now, I would strongly encourage them to watch that on the ANA website. But to briefly say here, we can again, address like our implicit and explicit biases. So that means revisiting our nursing curriculum so that it's not just something that you get, you know, in one class on one day where they say, hey, treat all people as individuals, you know, and thoroughly assess them, but that it's literally threaded throughout from their, you know, entry to exit experiences, that they're getting content on racial injustice, that they're getting content on the social determinants of health so that people understand everything that their clients are bringing to them. Um, I think we can also do a better job of preparing people for real world situations, you know, so knowing that the fact that racism and social determinants of health and all these other things affect healthcare, that then changes how we practice. It changes the way that we design our research studies. And I think there needs to be things in place. So let's say for the academic environment, the academy is not exempt from structural racism either. So we have to revisit within our nursing schools the ways that white supremacy, racism, and other ills have even negatively affected the training environment, right? Negatively affected faculty who work in these places and then students and staff who are engaged in them as well. I know a lot of this, as we're talking about it, is social and putting in programs and things like that. You also do work with geomapping and GIS data and obviously technology and data Data is a big part of population health. How are you using that data and what sort of things have you been doing with that? Yeah, so I really love maps because they tell a story in ways that's difficult to comprehend with words or numbers alone. And so let's say if we use coronavirus as an example, when you can have a visual, right, of where the cases are and then overlay that with factors like healthcare system access, type of employment, it helps you start to see patterns of where things are happening, where you may need to, you know, reallocate resources. And so you can also, by seeing that, leverage GI to then locate community-based organizations in those areas and facilitate mobilizing their staff to then do education, testing, providing services. You know, we don't have to invent the wheel. We don't have to reinvent it. I mean, there are people who are already on the ground doing this work. And so technology such as GIS can be used to sort of find where these areas are and then not only sort of like track clusters, but then monitor responses to any efforts that we do. Um, and it also gives ability to do more sophisticated analyses so that you can even look at correlates or predictors of change over time. So I think, you know, as we begin to envision a new world and think about what are the things that we need to do to really make a difference moving forward, yes, it's going to be important to have the racial data just because right now, you know, it's the proxy for racism until we get things right. But in addition to that, by using let's say GIS or even social media, we're able to more accurately engage with people in the spaces where they are and then see what we need to do uh, to make a difference moving forward. Can you give some examples perhaps you might have of things that are working or where you think uh, they're getting better, doing a good job in some of these programs? Yeah, so a powerful example here in Philadelphia, there's a group called the Black Doctors Consortium, and they started out doing coronavirus testing with individuals, like going out into the community. So instead of saying, you know, come to this healthcare system to be tested, they were set up in parking lots in different areas, meeting people right where they were, and able to kind of like back, uh, bypass some of the barriers that we have to seeking treatment now. But I know from personal accounts that they had partnered with two of our largest churches in the city, uh, Enon Tabernacle Baptist Church, as well as the Church of Christian Compassion. And as a result, they were able to test more than 5,000 people. Um, and I believe, you know, the communities that they were in, it was predominantly uh, black populations that were tested. And so by using that strategy, they brought coronavirus testing to people who, again, were not being tested in other means. You know, these some of them were folks who had been tested turned away from the healthcare system. Some were even people who had mistrust or distrust of the healthcare system and so didn't want to go in, you know, to those settings for testing. And so this is like, you know, a concrete example of a way that we can partner with community entities and even faith-based institutions so that we can more efficiently deliver these essential public health services. 
And that gets to a really interesting point I've heard debated a couple times. You see these approaches that say, for example, let's take health literacy. Okay, we want to go ahead and get out into this group and improve their health literacy. At the same time, there are people on the other side who say, well, as a healthcare system, you just need to get your uh, communication down to that level. It's your responsibility to meet their need. How do you think that plays out, or is there differences there? Yeah, so health literacy in and of itself is really complex, right? Because there's the element of the healthcare system can produce something, but when we look at how I mentioned before, structural racism, even in the healthcare system, a lot of times when that is produced, you have to be mindful of who was around the table creating that content, right? And I am a community engaged researcher. And so for me, everything that I do needs to be informed by the population that I'm working with. And let's say even as, you know, a black woman, if I I do research with black women, my identity as a black woman doesn't mean that I don't also have to consult that population for the work that I'm doing. So when we're thinking about health literacy and creating content, if you're trying to do something, you know, in a Native American community or an urban Philadelphia black community, you know, a Latino uh, community, you have to have individuals representing those communities and not just at, you know, your like executive board or whatever level, but that who are living there, working there, you know, socializing there, because then when they're a part of creating the content, it helps to ensure that the messages make sense, right, that they're like culturally relevant and accessible, that it's encompassing all of the things that are happening on the ground and not just sort of from our like ivory tower perspectives of what we think is happening. So I do think it's kind of like a a dual approach where you can have the system identifying a need and saying, okay, these are some of the messages that we want to get out there, but there always has to be that validation or that check or that input from the community expertise to make sure that what you're developing is actually going to make sense and be adopted. And you sort of live that, as you said, you're a community-engaged researcher, and I love that term. Uh, those ter- Do you see healthcare organizations beginning to do that much more or is it still early or where are we in that process? So that's kind of tricky. I think there are some who have historically done it very well. We have extremely successful models of academic community partnerships, you know, through like Penn, Temple Drexel speaking here for the Philadelphia context. So there are ways where people in the academy realize I can have all of these degrees, but it does not mean that I know everything that I need to know, right, about this issue that you're dealing with. Um, And so there's, you know, in that respect, there are people who are doing a great job and who are doing it really well. Um, Some of it, though, ends up being sort of like pro forma where I invite you, I invite, you know, one person to my meeting to say that I had a community representative and then I move forward as though I had done focus groups with like 200 people. So there's people who are doing the work, but I think we can absolutely do a better job of not just engaging the community, but engaging them in meaningful ways. So let's say if you're running a research team, who's on your staff? You know, are you only staffed by people who do not look like the community that you're conducting research in? Are you, you know, like my work with youth, for example, I had high school students who were hired and paid to be a part of the team. There were undergraduates, you know, graduate students, just so that people across all levels, across all, you know, educational, socioeconomic backgrounds were a part of the team. So that way different perspectives are represented, you know, as we were developing interventions or coming up with surveys, even creating our and recruitment materials is so important to have those voices. Do you think, given where we are now and the, the issues raised, it's really you know come to the fore both because of COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement, are, are, is this going to get us to the shift? Do you feel comfortable or positive that we're going to move this time? Yeah, I really, <laughs> I hope and pray so. I, you know, to be transparent, it gets exhausting as a black woman. You turn on the TV and it's like, you know, your people are dying from this disease. Your people are being killed, you know, unarmed by police. Like, it's just a constant death and destruction narrative, even for, you know, my Latino family, friends, and colleagues, where it's like people are still in detention centers, right? Like there's so much going on. So I think, and I'm hoping that we have reached a moment of like critical consciousness as a nation to where we say the things that are happening have been happening for so long, but it doesn't mean that we're going to continue to allow them to go there, right? Because the inclination Mm -hmm. right now, everyone is rushing to quote unquote, go back to normal. They just want Mm -hmm. things to be, you know, how they were before coronavirus 
virus hit. And for me, pre-coronavirus wasn't necessarily a beautiful world. Like it was nice to have some of my loved ones still living, you know, for those that passed from COVID-19, right. but there was a lot that was going on that still was not good or healthy for people who looked like me. So I do think now because we were quarantined, you know, and we were home and for some individuals, they were more of a captive audience, people who may have been able to turn the channel, stop scrolling through their feed, you know, find other ways to disengage from the conversation. It's been put so upfront in their faces that they now feel you know, reinvigorated and, and, and charged to do something because they're finally seeing the injustice. You know, for those who would say, oh, well, if you just comply, you know, police officers won't bother you. Or if you just, right. you know, eat healthy, uh, you don't have to worry about diabetes. They're beginning to see like, wow, there's a piece of this story that because of my lived experience, I was never privy to. You know, and when people even tried to tell me because of my own biases and my worldview, I shut it out because I didn't see a place where that was possible. But now they're starting to consider other alternatives. Mm -hmm. And you raised an issue that we just have a minute or two here to discuss. And you talked about the stress that you feel that you're experiencing because of the message. And obviously that stress has been there for a long time just from the inequities mm -hmm. that have existed. Are you seeing an approach to begin to try to bring some additional behavioral health or mental health services and make those more available to the community as this stress level rises because of what's going on? Absolutely. So I have seen, I haven't seen the legs put behind it yet, but I have seen more calls, um, even to the federal level, for funding to be put toward behavioral health. This is absolutely something when we think about racial trauma, when we think about, you know, weathering effects of just constantly being conscious of what's happening and the effect and toll that that takes on the body, we absolutely need to make sure that individuals have access to affordable, if not free, therapy options, right? We have to get messages out there so that people can engage in practices to counteract the trauma that they're experiencing, whether that's yoga, meditation, prayer, you know, spending time outdoors. And so I do see there is an uptick of interest, you know, of making these options available. And even for our healthcare providers who have been mm -hmm. on the front lines of this pandemic, they, you know, PTSD is real. And so when you right. have four, five, six people die in one shift, when before that was maybe only happening, you know, once a week or in a month, they're going to need supports as well. And so, yes, there have been calls to make that happen. Um, and I'm just hoping that people will follow through because all of these things that we're talking about need to have dollars behind it, right? There needs to be funding investment instead of just thoughts and well wishes and, you know, hashtags so that we can right. see things change. It really is a question of doing something. And Dr. Bronner, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been fantastic to have you on Pop Health Week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was honored. I'll turn it back over to you, Greg. And thank you, Fred. That is the last word on today's broadcast. I want to thank Brigitte M. Bronner, Ph.D., APRN, Associate Professor of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, for her time and insights today. For more information on Dr. Bronner and Penn Nursing's work in this space, do follow them on Twitter via at D-R-B-M-B-R-A-W-N-E-R, Dr. B.M. Bronner, and at Penn Nursing, respectively. And for more information on Penn Nursing, go to nursing.upenn.edu. For Pop Health Week, my colleague Fred Goldstein and Health Innovation Media, this is Greg Masters saying, bye now.